the river has dried up. Tuanate mana, tuanate whenua. You see it coming through here, the little plants. The new growth. Yeah. Mm. New growth seemed most prolific near the slip edge where seed had been spread by birds as well as the wind. Toward the centre, it was sparser. Lichens, herbs and a few shrubs were doing their best to reclothe the barest surfaces. Out on the slip, we also met some locals. It seemed that this was a highly favoured site from which they hijacked the walkers. Kias are mountain parrots that live their whole lives up here. You can't blame them for accepting handouts. Mountain living must be particularly tough for the kids. They'll eat anything. Unattended boots, packs, even tents can be literally destroyed by their sharp beaks. But I love them. They're resourceful and intelligent, and the mountains would be a much poorer place without them. Most of the track is over the surfaces of old landslips, but the Nine Mile was a large slip. It had dammed the river and created a lake behind it. We're still being affected by this big landslip that we've just passed through, and the water had backed up so that it had actually killed quite a few of the trees. It's the sort of thing that must be happening all the way up this valley, I reckon, these sort of slips just tumbling sure. off the side of these mountains. and. Yeah, but it must have been pretty, pretty, you know, it's not a typically pretty thing and therefore not something that people immediately pick on as pretty and worth photographing. Stopping here I could see what I think were some nice compositions just amongst those gaunt dead skeletal-like trees. From tracks beginning to tracks end we were never far from ferns and I doubt we ever lost sight of the prickly shield fern. Never. To me, it's new life. It's come from the parent leaves here. It grows. It goes in on itself. And it's just the same way as when a child is conceived, and it stays like that. When it's born, it'll open. The new life will form. The new ideas will evolve. And, you know, I see my own children here. It's one of the first things they've even learned to draw and to trace it themselves, to actually touch the plant, to feel it. And of course, once it has blossomed, the new life will begin again. Another fern, Blecknam also featured more varieties than I'd ever seen before. Not only ferns, but fungi, mosses, liverworts and lycopods all grow thickly on every surface. They give the fuel and forest a distinct wet-suited look. I'm sure many people miss seeing the orchids. Quite forgivable though. Some of them are very small. More obvious were the trees and shrubs and flower. At best, the New Zealand forest offers a fairly modest show of small white flowers. On the site of an old hut grew European creeping buttercup. It certainly put on a brighter show than some of the little native buttercups we saw on the track side. But there was a good chance we'd see the biggest buttercup in the world, the giant mountain buttercup, 
next day on the pass, which we saw for the first time from a clearing about midday. The clearing wasn't the result of a landslip, but a more regular event in these parts. Hidden Lakes is a water-filled depression caused by an avalanche, and avalanche had created the clearing. And as the lake edge was littered with snow grass from a recent avalanche, it was a potent reminder to keep moving. Avalanches close the track during winter. And before each walking season, each of the 50 known avalanche paths on the track are checked. The second night stop for guided walkers is Pompolona Lodge, a new complex which had sudden beginnings a few years ago. It was erected in five weeks, in time for the 1983 trekking season. During the previous winter, a huge avalanche upstream dammed the river, but later breached, sending a torrent of water downstream, all but demolishing the old building. Nowhere is totally safe in this vigorous landscape, and unused tracks have unexpected destinations. There's nothing half-hearted about Italian style, or the Italians that admire it. That's why they prefer the full, rich flavor of Café Haag. Europe's favorite decaffeinated coffee. There's nothing half-hearted about Café Haag. It's the taste that makes it Europe's favorite decaffeinated coffee. Plaque is the main cause of tooth decay and gum disease. It can be thought of as an ever-advancing army of bacteria. To combat this attack, McLean's contains fluoride and an antibacterial agent. Regular brushing with McLean's helps protect teeth and gums by fighting the advance of plaque. McLean's. All toothpastes are not the same. Meet Vera, Britain's most diabolical dinner lady. Her chocolate pudding is a legend in its own laundry. Too diabolical for her liquid, she thinks. So testing aerial liquid seems like a waste of time. But Vera doesn't know it's double biological. Unlike hers, which only has one cleaning action, aerial liquid has two. So while she gets leftovers with her liquid, Ariel polishes off the lot. A first for Vera's chocolate pudding, Ariel liquid, double biologically clean. When you're working up a hunger, there's only one real McCoy. Extra thick for the biggest, crunchiest home-style chips with a whole lot more potato taste. <laughs> The real McCoy, the big chip from the big country. Got the sister and her family over this Sunday. Only one thing for it, glazed leg of lamb. Make a nice change for the nephews. Leg of British lamb glazed with honey and orange juice. <laughs> then just slam in the oven. Oh, I love kids. Used to be one myself. creative slam in the lamb British lamb over four months the average family uses about 22 toilet rolls the odd 4,000 gallons of water but only one little tub of new maxi flush maxi flush contains a powerful bleach with every flush it releases a surge of germ killing power that helps to keep the whole toilet clean and hygienic maxi flush gives you up to four months of bleach protection now that's a lot of flushes New Maxi Flash, the power behind the throne. 
My sister's a greaser. It makes her prone to spots. Her cosmetic cleanser just isn't enough. But Clearasil removes twice as much grease and helps prevent spots. Now she uses it every day. Maybe it's gone too far. Spot the difference Miracle. with Clearasil. snow or ice coming down through here mm -hmm. and so we've just got like um the fuchsia called tuka tuka and the mako mako and yeah. the mako yeah. and then of course you you know you'd have take that one koromiko that's used for um sore stomachs oh is it a handy one that yeah very handy you just take the center leaves and chew them but when it's boiled it's used as an infusion as a gargle for um babies Good to flush out the kidneys too. It was Andy Dennis who drew attention to the pair of rare blue ducks. I was looking for them all day. You know, yeah. All the pools up the river here, and then just heard them from the track yeah. going. That you know that sad whistling. It's such a pity that you see them so little these yeah. days. Because a hundred years ago they were probably one of the most numerous ducks in New Zealand. And they're just so friendly. Mm -hmm. Blue ducks have disappeared from most parts of New Zealand due mainly to loss of protective forest along riverbanks. They're insect feeders, with soft membranes on their bills for feeding on the underside of rocks. A stop of more than a few minutes on the track is usually the cue for a weka to appear. Another bird with an eye for a handout, weckas are flightless swamp hens. After several hours walking across avalanche paths, it was comforting to see our hut settled in old beech forest. It meant avalanches don't come this way. I hope your stay here is a safe and enjoyable one. Basically, you've got a nine mile walk from Montaro over the pass to Dumpling tomorrow. That's going to take you approximately seven hours. It's depending on how fit you are. That's for a person of average fitness. Well, the easy part was behind us. From the hut, we could see the next day's route and it seemed more like a wall. Fitness was to be well tested on the way up to the pass. The next day, we were woken by the Kias and Craig and Andy at 5 a.m. Our companions were keen to take photographs before it rained again. The Kias arrived at Montaro Hut at 5 every morning, ready for mischief. They poke the fittings for anything loose. They probe the weak spots for anything not secured. Even the radio aerials and solar panels, which are supposedly Kia-proofed, won't be safe for long. It promised to be cold up on the pass. We'd need plenty of fuel. <coughs> Hut warden Neil Matheson and ranger Hugh Wooderson were off climbing leaving Craig and Andy at the bottom of the pass in Cloud Forest. I call it Cloud Forest because obviously the mosses that just droop over every little piece and branch and twig are there because there's a lot of mist and, and that's because we're right under a mountain pass and in a very, very damp and wet area. There's not the type of forest that you normally associate or find in temperate countries. In fact, it's the sort of forest that you find in tropical countries at high altitudes, where there is lots of mist and cloud gathers. Something a little bit eerie, even mystic about a place like this. It's almost as if it belongs in the realms of myth and fairy tale, and 
it's not too hard for me to see how some people coming through here in, in certain moods find it quite a difficult place to linger. Down Valley, the day appeared to hold little promise. It was bucketing down at Pompolona Lodge. But the over 70s were ready for the big climb. Sort of leapt along the uh, Rio Bamber in Peru and been caught in avalanches in South America. So this is quite a day for me as well. Um, I think I'm looking most forward to getting the top of the pass because after that, I've got it made. <laughs> the downhill is trivial, the uphill is tough. Walkers follow a route over the pass that was pioneered more than 100 years ago by one Quinton McKinnon. I'm sort of exploring how Quentin McKinnon discovered this pass. I mean, following the river was the obvious first step. And then where did he decide to go however he went it was kind of a, uh, the approach that I'm taking to the whole thing. So I want to see if I can figure out what he saw when he first discovered the route up over the pass. In earlier times, the route had been used by Maori traders, then forgotten. In the 1880s, the government offered a reward for an overland route to the fjords. So it became a race, with Quinton McKinnon, the Shetland Islander, exploring valleys from inland, and Donald Sutherland, a gruff Scotsman, coming at it from the fjords. Sutherland may have lost the race, but as he and his wife lived at Milford Sound, their reward was accommodating all the walkers who soon began to use the new track. It still draws travellers here like a magnet. Many have never walked off pavement before, but McKinnon's route is successfully traversed by 8,000 walkers every season. What's that? How do the greens with these strings? There are 12 zigzags on the way up. Most of them are in beech forest. Only the last few zigs and zags are out in the open. The wind was picking up, swirling mist and cloud and it hid the view of the huge glacial cirque, the source of the Clinton River. Beyond the protection of the forest, even the exertion of climbing wasn't enough to keep us warm. Although they might get a bit sort of wind blast and further up, so we should look out for a good one just up here. Although New Zealand rocks are old, the mountains are so young they're still growing, still being pushed upwards. Better we were walking this year. Next year the pass would be a few millimetres higher. Finally, we met the giant mountain buttercups. But up here they seem so out of place. The leaves look more like a pond plant and the giant buttercup flower seem more suited to a suburban garden than a mountain top. New Zealand mountains have many daisies, about 60 species from field daisies to daisies which look like a cushion. Cushion plants are made up of hundreds of rosettes crouching shoulder to shoulder, ready to face virtually whatever nature might throw at them. What nature threw at our party as we neared the top was pea soup. There was little else to do but pose beneath McKinnon's memorial. Yeah, nice, thank you. He does this on a daily basis. Does he? Yeah. Yeah. He's got a great market for cameras down the bottom of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> but as we waited, a breeze sprung up which drew back the mist. I couldn't believe our luck. The high point of the track became a high point of our enjoyment. We were so high up there, looking down at everything. Everyone is there. Rangi Nui, Sky Father.